Welcome to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College, the focus of our show, Workplace and Workforce Trends. Always looking for people to stimulate us with ideas on things that we can do a little bit better in our workplace, with our teams, with our peers, our colleagues, whatever it may be. Looking for ideas from workplaces of people that are doing things differently. Today's show is a little bit different in that I've always wanted a farmer on the show. In fact, I've asked Kristen and John over the past, do we know any farmers? It's the fact that they feed so many people, you would think that they're definitely, quote unquote, working. They're obviously working. Farmers work harder than anyone else. But how are they doing it? What is the the trends in farming today that may stimulate us? Well, we've reached out. None of us really know a true farmer. But we've reached out from time to time, and we've had a, a guy from Napa Valley. He called himself a farmer. He cre- he grows grapes for wines, but he says at the very bottom, very very core of what I do, I'm a farmer. We've had tree farmers on, or people that manage forests and uh, uh, that that manage um, big tracts of land. They're kind of a tree farmer, but we've never found one. We've never really locked into one, and we're always searching for different type of jobs, uh, people to have on the the show. In front of me, I'm holding in my hands the Mobile Bay Monthly, November 2019 magazine. On one of the articles in this thing is called The Business of Farming. It's written by Maggie Lacey. And in here, they interview a guy named Stuart Perkins, who's got an MBA, lives over in Fairhope Foley somewhere, and kind of doing some unique things around the farm. So I'm reading this the other day in bed, and it gets to a point in the article that he references this guy named Joel Salatin at Polyface Farms. And it talks about uh, the books that Joel has written and the documentaries he's been in. And I went, oh my gosh, this guy's on our list of people. He's on the, uh, the call list. He's an interview that we have upcoming. And I had put him on the calendar. He had been recommended by John Thompson, who produces the show. And Kristen had organized it and gotten him on the calendar. But I wasn't really familiar with him. But when I read the name in this article out of Mobile Bay Monthly, I ran to make sure I got the name right. And yes, Joel Salatin is an upcoming guest of ours. In fact, he's our guest today. Now, What makes Joel different is that he's an atypical, a non-traditional farmer for our times. Joel does things, uh, I guess, the natural way and non-traditional way of farming. In fact, one could argue that it's before traditional way of farming. This is back to the old school stuff. And he has developed a following, I've learned, of people that think he uh, and his farming techniques are the way of the future. The food tastes better. The food is better for you. The food is uh, local or quasi-local compared to the chickens and the beef, etc., that get shipped all over the country. So our farming guest today kind of landed in my lap. And I didn't realize it till I was reading the Mobile Bay Monthly uh, article that the guy on the calendar for our interview today was indeed a farmer, but a non-traditional farmer. This guy does a lot of presentations. He's sought after all over the world for his opinions and his attitude and his insights into farming techniques. He is represented, this is interesting to me, by a speaker's bureau out of London. He lives outside of Washington, D.C. in the Shenandoah Valley, and goodness knows there's a dozen speaker's bureaus in Washington, D.C. that would be quasi-local for him, But no, it's a London bureau that represents him, which really piqued my interest. What's this guy got to say? Who is he? And what does he know about farming that a bureau in London wants to send him all over the world to talk about it? Well, when we come back from break, we're going to meet Joel Salatin. Joel is a farmer. He lives in Swoop, Virginia. His farm is called Polyface Farms, and we're going to learn what he's up to. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College, and we will be right back. Think about how people really see you. The kid at the drive-thru just sees a coffee drinker. Please pull forward. Your local barista sees the person who loves a smiley face in their latte. See you next time. It's kind of the same way with insurance. Other insurance companies just see a customer. But a State Farm agent sees more. They see you as a neighbor. Your State Farm agent is here to get to know who you really are so they can help life go right. 
Call me, State Farm Agent Allison Horner, and Mobile at 666-1616. Hey, this is Cam Marston. If sales in your business comes from prospecting to create leads that lead to sales, I want to tell you about Sales Up Coach, a cloud-based system created for the next generation of sales professional. There's a big difference between being busy and being effective. And Sales Up Coach helps salespeople who rely on prospecting uncover which of their activities produce the greatest results. Over time, Sales Up Coach's machine learning hones salespeople's schedule to focus only on activities that generate the most bang for the buck. Your sales team interacts with Sales Up Coach on their smartphone, and sales managers can instantly generate reports to see who is on goal and who may need additional support. Go online and take a look at this new and very powerful sales tool. Go to salesupcoach.com slash Cam Marston. Watch your sales team's productivity change. Is your business growing? Does your existing metal building need an update? Expansion? New roof? With almost 20 years of experience, Mosley Building Systems is the leading metal building contractor along the Gulf Coast. We are your local design build experts. From expansion to new construction or repairs, we can guide you through all aspects of your project. Mosley Building Systems works with each client to fulfill their vision. For more information, go to MosleyBuildingSystems.com. Listening to What's Working, I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College. On the line, I've got Joel Salatin. Joel is a farmer. He lives in the Virginia area. And when my buddy, the producer of this show, John Thompson, got back from a conference after hearing Joel speak, he was on fire. And John is seldom on fire, but he was on fire saying, You got to get this guy on the show. He's brilliant. He's a genius. And after I Googled his name and looked around. I can see that he is, I, we have not discovered him. In fact, he's been long, long popular in the media as well as in his community. Joel, thank you so much for your time. Welcome to What's Working. Thank you, Cam. It's great to be with you. Yes. I um, tried to get a description from John of what it is that you do and why he thinks you're a genius. And all he did was babble incoherently about just great and wonderful, et cetera. Joel, tell us what it is that you do. Tell us about Polyface Farms and tell us why you've caught the attention of so many different groups out there. <laughs> well, so uh, so we're in pastured livestock, and that includes beef, pork, turkey, chicken, rabbit, duck, uh, the whole gamut of livestock. When you think about livestock in America, the first thing that generally comes to your mind is some sort of a, of a large confinement house, a chicken house, a pig house, a beef feedlot, a, a turkey house. And so when you start talking about pastured livestock, imagine, imagine raising um, pretty large sizes of volumes of this, not in a building, not in a house, but actually out on pasture. And so if you're going to put them on pasture, obviously, uh, if, you, if you don't move them around uh, rapidly, you're going to pretty much end up with, uh, with a, what we call a moonscape, where it's just dirt. So uh, what we're doing is we're mimicking the natural choreography of animals in nature, and they move, and they move in groups, and... All of their, you know, all of their, their mechanisms and their control, everything is mobile. And so we use uh, portable electric fencing. We use uh, portable shelters that all have funny names like eggmobiles and shade mobiles and gobbledygoes and that sort of thing. But, but, but portable shade, uh, which means we need portable water, all of that to move with them. So, so that's on the production end. And then what that does is make a product, make a, make a, a protein that is a, new, a different nutrient profile, taste profile, and texture profile, which then creates a demand in the marketplace for people who are looking for something that's different than 
than the you know the orthodox uh, uh, fair. So you know those are things that make us uh, very different than the, as they would say in a children's book than the average bear. Yeah, yeah. But it, this is what's old is new again, right? This is the way these animals used to live yeah, well, back in the day, right? Yeah. Well, it, 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 there is certainly some nostalgia to this. I mean, the idea of of um, of multiple species instead of one species on a farm. So there's a lot of diversity rather than today the you know the more uh, mono speciated kind of uh, outfit. But um, I am very quick to point out that we are not luddites. We are not against technology. We we use. Uh, uh, technology every minute that would make grandpa uh, salivate if he could get it. I mean, from electric fence to water pipe to, um, um, you know, electric netting to lightweight to, to, you know, with a bandsaw mill where we can uh, mill such tiny dimension lumber that we can make actually portable infrastructure uh, out of tinker toys. You know, grandpa couldn't do that in the old days with the old kind of uh, sawmills the um, the kerf that the kerf is the is the width of the blade. It was so big that you could never afford to mill little dimension material. Um, that's why everything was log cabins and timber frame because it was much cheaper to make a big piece of wood than a small piece of wood because of the the amount of waste in the sawdust in this large kerf. But today, with bandsaw mills, we can literally make half-inch by one-inch lath material, and at the end of the day, we only have a wheelbarrow load of sawdust, and so we can, we can with, with extremely good um, bracing and design, make very, very lightweight, portable infrastructure so that instead of having big stationary sheltering and structures, we have mobile sheltering and structures. Is this, are you doing this, Joel, because there's a profit motive? Are you doing this because it's the right thing to do? You describe yourself, and I'm going to read from the bio here, Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic, uh, which is a wonderful description. Tell me your motivation to begin this. Why did you even start and there's a part of me that says when you concentrate the animals in a feedlot, in a chicken coop or a, a, a breeding station, the efficiencies gained by keeping them tightly, cl- closely packed are, uh, oh, and the profitability that could come from that outweigh this more uh, difficult effort than you're doing. What's your motivation here? Yeah, uh, well, I, I would say, I would say that uh, first off, Efficiency is not necessarily effectiveness. There's a big difference between efficiency and effectiveness. You can be efficient about the wrong thing. I mean, you can be a very efficient bank robber. Uh, is, <laughs> is is that an effective way to make a living? Well, maybe not. You know, and so so uh, efficiency is not necessarily the end game. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't care about efficiency, but it does mean that the first thing we want to do is go the right direction. And if we, and once we go the right direction, then yes, then some um, efficient speed is great, but, uh, but we've got to go the right direction first. Well, what's the right direction? Well, the right direction is that if whatever we're doing is not ultimately healthy or healing for us, for the ecosystem, for the planet, for the economy, for emotions, for, I mean, just, just uh, when I, when I use the term healing and healthy, um, I, I'm thinking very, very broadly, not just, you know, uh, not getting a cold this season. And, and when, when, when that becomes our overriding, uh, uh objective, then, then, um, that, that is the, that is the goal that we're going for. And it trumps everything else. If we're, if we are being efficient, but creating sickness or destroying the soil or destroying the water or destroying our health, uh, we can efficiently destroy our health. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> you can be very efficient at smoking cigarettes. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, and, and so um, I, I don't, I don't want to belittle efficiency, uh, but but I do want to point out that. That efficiency is only positive if you're being efficient, going the right direction. And and much of agriculture today, much of the food system, is actually um, 
destroying the ecology, it's destroying our health. Uh, in many ways, it, it destroys our rural economies. And, uh, and so that, that's not a place where I want to be efficient. You're not trained, if I'm reading your bio correctly, you're not trained out of Bob Jones University as a ag economist in the agricultural sciences, are you? Did I get that correct? Oh, no, I, I was an English major. Yeah. In fact, my, my dad always laughed and said, actually, I majored in, I was on the debate team throughout high school and college. And I was in drama and, and uh, public speaking and all that. And so he said, I always, I always majored in uh, in the uh, extracurricular activities and just went to school because I had to. Yeah. So you you <laughs> you didn't you didn't train you didn't see this coming as a as a young man saying I think we can we can do uh, agriculture we can do livestock rather livestock better. Uh, you just kind of begin to observe this what was the turning what was the motivation to begin a uh, uh, uh to to renew the way the farm works yeah well i stand on the shoulders of some great uh, of a great family legacy my my grandfather my dad's dad uh, was a charter subscriber to rodale's organic gardening and farming magazine when it first came out in about 1949 and my dad got his got a, a, a you know an environmental bent from him but my dad was a train was a train in business administration he was an accountant so he was a numbers guy and and he came to this uh what what i mean one of the fun, funnest part of the stories to tell is i think my dad came to this not not so much as an environmentalist, but he came to it as an economist, realizing that the chemical approach, the pharmaceutical approach, uh, uh, was was like a treadmill. It was like a drug addiction, and you couldn't get ahead of the toxicity. You couldn't get ahead of the pathogenicity. You couldn't get ahead of the de- of the dependence on outside inputs, uh, fertilizer, chemicals, pesticides. We're going to go to a break. I want to talk to you about these chemicals when we come back, and I want to hear more of your dad's story. Folks, you're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College. We're with Joel Salatin, and we'll be right back. Successfully running a business requires dedication and long hours, and Joel Salatin knows this well. It also requires effectively communicating with others, managing employees, and practicing solid accounting skills. Coastal Alabama Community College offers all these topics and more in two programs of study in small business and entrepreneurship. They offer both a two-year associate in applied science degree and one-year training certificate. These programs are designed for students' immediate entry into the workforce, either in a new job or as a way to further their current knowledge in their current position. For more information, go to coastalalabama.edu or visit one of their campuses today. We'll be right back. The Community Foundation of South Alabama links donors to philanthropy, builds networks across eight counties, and builds dreams for those in need. Through our donors' gifts, we make investments that enhance our community via initiatives with broad impact. Working with you, we build communities. Contact us at communityfoundationsa.org. This is Coastal Alabama Community College, where education is key and where there is opportunity in every classroom. We serve nine counties with one common goal. Here, we come together to create a brighter future. Together, we inspire. Together, we learn. Together, we succeed. This is Coastal Alabama Community College, all together. I'm Matt Armbruster with Ransom Ministries. We help people in our community that most others have given up on. Please donate your unwanted electronics to Ransom Recycling. We teach life skills, job readiness, and job creation through our electronic recycling program. We take anything with a cord. Find us at RansomMinistries.com or you can call us at 251-751-0044. 
We're back. This is Cam Marston. You're listening to What's Working. What's Working is brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College. On the line is Joel Salatin. Prior to the break, Joel, you were telling us a little bit about your dad's influence in this, and he saw, I, I love the way you put the pharmaceutical addiction of the land. Is that what you were saying? Yes, yes, it, it, it is. And, uh, you know, in the, in the fertilizer business, uh, you know, if you're using chemical fertilizers, you have to use more and more to get the same kick because there is a, there is a, a, a kind of a residual thing that builds up. Just like right now we're, we're seeing like MRSA and C. diff, these, these super bugs. I mean, we're seeing it in the Wall Street Journal every day. It seems like there's a, there's a new article about some new super bug that's being created by the overuse of, uh, of antibiotics mainly in our food system, in, our, in, our, uh, in these quote-unquote efficiently confined animals. And so these are what we call external costs to the efficiency of the industrial food system. And these external costs uh, begin to mount up. And so dad, dad uh, my dad as an economist, he saw these, these costs down the road and realized we have to look at nature as a template because nature ultimately runs as an economy on its own and uh, and does so regeneratively. It, it, it does so without using up stuff. It it actually, as a result of it, it, it actually leaves more than than it than it started with. And so, the, how do we build soil? How do we hydrate the landscape? How do we make more breathable air? How do we sequester more carbon? You know, these were the these were the questions. And we looked at nature as a template and said, how can we use modern technology to massage this natural pattern, this natural template, into more abundance than it was capable of, even in a static state? And and that became the overriding objective uh, as we move forward. So your mo- your, this reminds me of the end of Manifest Destiny. And, I, you know, so let's take maybe a, an academic's approach to the study Manifest Destiny. People came to the new world and said, we're going to use labor and technology and science to change the face of the landscape and make it do what we want it to do. And you're moving towards Japanese gardening. What is the natural pro- <laughs> proclivities of the landscape? And let's just enhance what it's already doing. Is that about right? Well, yes, it is. And, and I would suggest, I, I think it's important for people to realize that 500 years ago, the what is today the United States was actually more, it, it actually produced more nutrition, more food than it does today with, you know, with machinery and, and um, hybrid seeds and everything else. Um, now, all that food didn't go to people, although there was, remember, you know, no, more than 90% of the indigenous population was decimated with European diseases in the century, you know, between 1492 and 1600. And so, uh, so it's hard for us to appreciate all of the, you know, the indigenous, uh, uh, you know, people that were here prior to Europeans coming. But uh, the, the thing is, there was a tremendous amount of food produced. I mean, we had over a hundred million bison. Yeah. Uh, feed, feeding, feeding, uh, arguably two million wolves, each of whom needed twenty pounds of meat a day. Dang. We had two. We had two hundred million beavers uh, eating eating more vegetable matter than all the people in the United States today. Uh, we had we had flocks of birds, passenger pigeons. Uh, uh, Audubon, uh, uh, the the famous uh, bird lover, Audubon sat under a tree. He put in his diary in uh, like 1800. He said, "said I was under this tree, and for three days I could not see the sun because of the the birds flying over." It was uh, passenger pigeons, and, and, and all this was done before Tyson chicken houses, yeah. you know, and and. Uh, uh, Monsanto came along. This was all done before then, and so, um, so the, the question is, how do we, how do we uh, um, create with private uh, private ownership and fencing and property rights and all the, the different things that we Westerners have brought to the equation? How do we tease out from nature this latent historically active abundance? Uh, that's, in, that's in a state of perpetuity 
that, that built the plains, that built the soil, that built the wealth that our nation has enjoyed for, you know, 250 years. Does Tyson look at you as a as a threat? Does Monsanto and Dow Chemical look at you as a threat? Uh, uh, the Smithfield pork or whatever? How do they think of you? Uh, well, I don't know if they're aware of me or not, but uh, b- but for sure, if um, if everybody started doing what we did, they would be out of business. So to that extent, yes, they probably do look at us as a threat. Although I would say long before they were out of business. The, uh, the 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 context of our food and farming system would so fundamentally change that they would begin actually uh, making changes as well. Your bio reads that you won't sell any of your chickens, your eggs, your beef outside of a four-hour drive of your farm. You're going to mandate that it stays local. Is that the case? That is the case until until july 4 this year and Uh-oh. so we have to <laughs> so we we have to update that yes we, we that's been part of our mantra but if you're familiar with the little business book who moved my cheese yeah. about these two yeah. mice that go and then somebody moved their cheese they have to learn a different way well that's exactly what's happened to us when we develop these kind of uh um boundaries around our own business and we wanted to be hyper local uh, we did. We did uh, actually. You know that that was one of our key things. But that was before Amazon and before uh, the internet, before online shopping carts. And what's happened is somebody moved our cheese. And so I'm all about nostalgia as long as as long as I don't become obsolete. Nostalgia is wonderful until you become obsolete. <laughs> right. And so. Uh, in the last couple of years, we have definitely felt this this cheese move, and so we have to move and adapt with it. Shipping is now a very, very small part of our business, but it does allow us to reach cousins and friends of, of, of customers that do live nearby, say, wow, I wish my, you know, my in-laws could get this food, or I wish my cousins could. Now it allows us to reach those people that are that are asking for it that that uh, heretofore have been more difficult to get what are you shipping are you shipping eggs are you shipping beef are you shipping everything oh uh, no we're not we're not shipping we're not shipping eggs we are shipping beef beef pork and chicken yes yeah so was it your intention when you began this to become a statement to to, to become a motivator you've had you've written three books uh folks this ain't normal Title of one, You Can Farm, the title of another, and The Salad Bar Beef. I'd like to hear about that one. That's an interesting title. And you've been featured on documentaries. There's one called Food, Inc. and another called Fresh and highlighted prominently in Michael Pollan, Poland, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, book, The Omnivore's yeah. Dilemma. Did you expect so much attention when you began doing this? Were you discovered doing this? Or did you say, I see something that needs to be done and I need to be the champion of it, not just here under my own feet, but outside of here as well? Yeah, what a, what a great question. So, you know, m- most great things in life are fairly uh, serendipitous. Uh, they're unplanned. I mean, how, how many college grads 10 years down the road are doing what they thought they'd be doing True. when they were in college? And so, so uh, for Teresa and I, you know, we, so, so uh, mom and dad bought, you know, bought this piece of land in 1961. Mom was a school teacher. Dad was an accountant. Uh, the all farm jobs paid for the land. So that, uh, so it was a wonderful place to grow up. And you know, do the forts and the and the stream dams and, and and have the garden and all the things that we did growing up. It was basically a glorified homestead. We always milked a cow or two. We raised a couple of pigs. Uh, we had a, we had a few cows. We sold some calves, uh, but it was it was not what you would call a, a going concern. But as I as I came into high school, I. I had a flock of chickens. I had my little chicken business and a garden, and uh, I sold direct to uh, on a on a a curb market here that was a precursor to today's farmers markets back in the you know early seventies. And I just loved it, and I wanted I wanted to farm as a vocation. I mean, my my grandfather wanted to, he never did. My dad wanted to, he never did. So here here we were, three generations into this, and I got that bug. Said I want to farm full time. And with, with, uh, with Dad's sharp pencil and our correct 
you know, objective of a, of a more natural way of farming. We were able to combine the economics and the ecology. And uh, um, so when Teresa and I got married there in, uh, in 1980, uh, we, we kind of, we kind of set this up as, so we're going to be here. We're, you know, we might not make much money. We're going to be here. And our, and our objective was simply, we want to make a living on this farm. We're a young couple, got this little farm. Can we actually make a living on it? And, um, and, and we did. I mean, it was tight the first, uh, three or four years, very, very tight. But, um, but gradually we saw, yes, this, this is going to work. And guess what happened? When this young, uh, couple without any outside income, without any outside uh, whatever nest egg, or you know, not from a wealthy family. As we began being successful, we be, we we got discovered. We got discovered by media. Our story was so captivating because how, how does a how does a, a real small farm with a couple how do they how do they make it? And so our success our success at just being able to, to stay in business and pay the bills and be happy about it uh, was a was a captivating story. There are a lot of people who would like to get out of the rat race and the commute to the you know to the Dilbert cubicle and and be entrepreneurial you know land stewards if they actually thought they could make a white collar salary. Yeah. So that was a captivating story, and the publicity just continued uh, you know on from there. And you're now motivating. Other people across the nation, in fact, there's a guy in Fairhope, Alabama, not far from where I am here in Mobile, uh, who cites you in an article in a, that was published last month. And I was reading that article and I recognized your name and I ran to my notes and said, yeah, he's on the schedule to be interviewed. So you've got uh, sway well outside of your own um, your own farm there and you're giving a lot of presentations. That's how John Thompson heard you. Tell me about what you're are your presentations on innovation? Are they on specific uh, tactical farming uh, methodology? What are you teaching people out there? Well, of course, every every seminar is going to be a little bit different uh, because the audiences are different. Uh, the one that uh, that John heard was a uh, was a two day school on um, on marketing that uh, my daughter in law and I did, uh, Sherry. And um, and it was it was about how do you market how do you market farm products as a as an entrepreneur how do you do this uh, this marketing thing um, how do you how do you find customers how do you track your inventory you know and, and of course that's to individuals restaurants institutions um, you know internet shipping whatever and uh, so you know that 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 was one so you know we're doing that I do I do a, I was just in uh, Montreal last week. And I did a very hardcore how-to. Here's here's how we uh, how we move the animals every day. Here's the infrastructure we use. Here are the protocols and principles. So you know that was what I was doing in Montreal. Um, actually, in a couple of weeks, I'll be back in uh, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, doing a school on succession. How do we how do we make the farm go from one generation to another? Uh, farmers are getting old, they're aging out. And one of the biggest issues we have right now is how do we how do we navigate these successional waters uh, through the generation? And uh, and then I'm going directly from there to Florida to do a, a, a day with uh, Dr. Al Sears, who's a, um, a, a medical doctor who's kind of developed a big clinic there on, on anti-aging and he does a, a seminar once every couple of years and uh, so I'll be there primarily with foodies uh, or, or you know people interested in wellness and health and I'll be talking about about the nutritional and um, uh, well just just the health benefits of eating um, pasture-based meats as opposed to um, meat coming from concentrated animal feeding operations. Let's take a break here, Joel, and, talk, and go to go to the commercials. I want to pick that up when we come back. I know that you're represented by a Speakers Bureau based in London. This is part of your story that I imagine you never saw coming either. Uh, really impressive. Folks, you're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. On the line is Joel Salatin. Uh, Joel is a farmer in the Virginia area. Joel, I'll get you in the Shenandoah Valley. Is it called Swoop or Swope? 
Swope. Swope, Virginia, and does some non-traditional methods and is having a good go at it. When we come back, I want to talk to you, Joel, about innovation and how to look at things differently and how that's worked for you. Again, you're listening to What's Working, brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College. We'll be right back. Think about your home. What do you see? Do you just see two stories or the stories of your toddler's first steps? <laughs> now think about your car. Do you see an odometer reading or your kids reading in the back seat? Other insurance companies just see a house. They just see a car. But a state farm agent sees what your home and your car really mean to you. So why not give them the protection they deserve? You can reach me, State Farm Agent Allison Horner, at allisonhorner.com. Investing. Connecting. Leading. Providing. The Community Foundation of South Alabama brings together philanthropic assets to make Southwest Alabama a better place to live, work, and play. We link donors to philanthropy. Working with you, we build communities. Contact us at communityfoundationsa.org. back. I'm Cam Marston. This is What's Working, brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College. And on the line with me is Joel Salatin. Joel is out of Swope, Virginia, uh, in the Shenandoah Valley there. He is a farmer with Polyface Farms there. Joel, innovation seems to be a key part of everything that you do. You look at things differently. You you identify opportunities. And, and let's face it, farming's been around for thousands and thousands of years, yet you have Uh, kind of redefine the way it's done today. If there are people listening, again, this is a business show that is designed to help business owners, managers, supervisors, et cetera. If there's something that you use that stimulates innovation or uh, gives you a way of seeing the world differently that leads to the success that you're having, what could you advise the listeners to do that may help them innovate in something that's old and traditional like what they may be doing? Uh, Yeah, I I, I think um, I think if I would boil it down the the first thing in innovation is to is to think about how can something be beneficial where where every, everybody wins um, so often we think about you know equations in order to to get one side up you have to lose the other side and uh, so most of our let me just say this in our innovation what we've done is simply say, well, how does nature work in a symbiotic in a symbiotic relationship? What are those patterns and templates? And then how can we duplicate that on a domestic uh, uh, thing? And and for example, it, it's basic stuff like animals move. You know, that's such a simple phrase. And yet, in our modern America, we don't think animals need to move. They need to be you know cooped up in a in a building. And so, as soon as you say well, animals move, then you have to come up with uh, portable controls, portable uh, shelters, um, you know, portable feeding systems, portable water delivery systems, all those kinds of things. I, I think the next uh, element of innovation is resilience. You're trying to create things that, can, that are stable enough to handle shocks. So... Um, so, for example, when we look at the landscape and say, how do, I, how do I massage this landscape so we can handle floods and droughts and wind and, you know, heat and cold and all those kind of things, what you see are, you start looking at the terrain differently. You don't now just see uh, cornfields. You start seeing, well, how does the air go across the landscape? Um, how does water move across the landscape? And so we've built a lot of ponds over the years. Why? Because if we're going to grow things, we need water. You know, water is more often than not, water is a, is a limiting factor. And so uh, we just keep investing in ponds. And uh, so now we have enough water that we can irrigate the farm. So this summer in a drought, we were able to dump a bunch of water 
uh, on the place that was from snow melt and hurricane uh, leftovers from back, you know, earlier in the season. Yeah. And during those times, we protected our downstream neighbors from flooding by having these ponds. And so um, how do we create, I call it belt, belt and suspenders, you know, how do we get belt and suspenders in our landscape so it's more resilient? And those are, those are principles that can apply to any business. Uh, you know, this, the whole SWOT analysis, you know, S-W-O-T, right. uh, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, we do that on, on different things. And I would just say the final, the final thing from a business standpoint one of the one of the biggest um, losses or leaks in a business is failure to capture all of the ideas from the team. And so, when we're struggling with an issue with something, we actually call a brainstorming session. The rule of that is nobody can judge anything. All we're doing in a brainstorming session is we just want ideas on the table. Everybody bring an idea put it on the table. We'll, we'll, we'll judge them later. But for today, everybody gets heard. Everybody's idea is on the table. And, and um, uh, you know, the, the Toyota lean business concept, uh, that was one of the biggest things they discovered was that they, they did not have um, a habitat that encouraged everyone from the janitor to the CEO to put ideas on the table. And truth is, all of us are working in our little, you know, sphere of expertise, and so we all see things a little differently, and we can make improvements a little differently. And as a business, we need to create a habitat that encourages capture of everyone's perceptions as they go about their routine. So when you go out and solicit ideas, are you looking only from your team, from the people that know your farm the best, or are you trying to find people outside of your environment, your ecosystem that may come in and be able to see things differently, much like what you've done on your farm, see things differently? <laughs> oh, uh, we definitely seek it from outside outside the, the farm. Um, I mean, I think the mastermind uh, idea a business idea is 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 great, uh, but I read widely. I mean, I haven't mentioned that in innovation, but one of the one of the critical factors is to read widely and eclectically read stuff that you wouldn't normally read, uh, because you'll see these aha moments uh, where you you touch yourself with somebody else's epiphany on their place, and often it has you know ramifications uh, for you. And so, uh, so, so eclectic reading is a, is a big one. And I, I read, I read voraciously and I, and I read things that have nothing to do with farming, um, on, on purpose. To try to stimulate something random and new, no, no, no telling exactly what you're going to learn from reading something well outside of your domain, huh? Yes, that, that's correct. Um, the, the, uh, the millennial business guru, Ty Lopez in his seminars, uh, the reason that he kind of does what he does is he said he said in all of his uh, research he's found the single most common denominator among successful business people is reading, and so uh, you've got to you've because th that that's the exposure that's the exposure to um, to other ideas. Yeah. So the the bio the website uh, the Wikipedia page. It all reads like you're, you've arrived. You've quote unquote arrived. You've got books. You've got movies made about the, your techniques. You've got a, a blog a, or a, a weekly blog or a daily blog. You've got followers. Uh, I read about you in a magazine before about the same time I heard about you. But there's got to be, uh, what I read about you reads that you're tireless, that there's always a challenge, that there's always something new. What is your challenge today? Is it simply to keep the farm, Polyface Farms, running, or is there something else that you're working on? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it is a journey. It's not a destination. So yeah. challenges today. So, um, yeah, actually, actually, uh, next next uh, um, summer, July 17 and 18, we will be hosting the first ever Mother Earth News Magazine on farm fair here at, at Polyface. And uh, in fact, that Tuesday I met with their management team to hash out actual logistics. We were here with the, 
you know, the tent company and different, how are we going to run traffic and all that? Because, you know, we're, we're, we're gearing up for 10,000 people Dang. over those two days. Uh, that's a challenge. That's a, that's a big deal. But um, we want we want to see uh, one of the reasons that, that we wanted to to offer to to host it to do it was to, to put a stake in the in the ground and say okay all you naysayers you know you get that many people out to a, a dirt road in Swope Virginia this is this is this is not um, just fringy stuff anymore it's it's a big deal uh, self reliance do it yourself ism. Uh, there are lots of people out here who are putting more attention on their compost pile than the impeachment process. Yeah. And that's a good that's a good thing. I think it is a good thing. And I think the compost pile and the impeachment process probably smell about the same. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. Uh, other challenges, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm desperate to try to get some sort of of true blue uh, food venue out there. I don't care if it's a if it's a diner, a food truck, what it is. So I'm talking with chefs and different things, trying to put together uh, some sort of of a little um, you know end end game here where folks can actually you know buy our our food as a as a ready to eat product. Um, and and goodness, you know, uh, in in my wildest dreams, I'd love to have a pastured livestock. Uh, clean food, fast food franchise that would go head to head with McDonald's and offer a truly, um, you know, uh, uh, e- ecology and nutritionally enhancing um, burger for folks that wanted to stop and get one at an interstate exchange. That would uh, be that would, that would be amazing. Yeah, it would. I mean, so so soccer mom can go and grab a grab a bite to eat and and know that she's doing good and not have this little bit of, um, you know, uh, guilt complex when she walks out the door. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, there's, um, there's a lot to do and it's an exciting time. One of the quotes, I wanted to save this to last, a testimonial on your website says that your eggs will jump up and slap you in the face. Your hen eggs will jump up and slap you in the face. There's the right thing to do. There's the ecological necessities of changing the farming but it sounds like underlying all this is it tastes better. Yes, uh, no, no, no question. I mean, you can you can talk about all sorts of things from animal welfare to nutrition to whatever. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't taste good, you're never going to get any traction. And so, uh, so one of our uh, one of my one of my favorite little. Uh, Tidbits was a customer that came one day, and and he was an old customer, and we and, and we had a new one here in the store, and she was asking about you know how we did things, and I was busy with another lady taking care of her, so the two of them kind of I was listening to their interchange out the side of my ear as I was dealing with somebody else, and and the guy finally he just laughed the old the old customer the old patron he said look. He said, it tastes so good, I don't care if they feed them diesel fuel. It tastes so good, I'd buy it anyway. Yeah. And, and to, me, to me, that's the ultimate, uh, that's the ultimate you know, uh, uh, loyalty is, is the taste. Let's finish up with a, with a question, Joel. What do people need to hear from your message? What do they need to know about you and what you're doing and how this may relate to themselves and their own workplace and their own teams? I think what I want everybody to know is that – most people have this underlying sense that our trajectory is is concerning. I'll just say I don't want to get into a bunch of, you know, whatever, climate change. I don't want to get all that stuff. I'm just saying that the way they see our, our, our resource base, our cultural base, our economic base, our national debt, I mean, name your thing, nutritional base, uh, that, that, that pick – one or all, but there is concern, just concern about our trajectory, childhood wellness, obesity, you know, all these things. And, and the message I want people to understand is that that trajectory that you're concerned about, you're concerned about it for your children, for your, for your grandchildren, that trajectory is not in stone. It can be shaped, changed, and inverted and and it's not going that change is not going to happen from 
Congress. It's not going to happen from the president. It's not going to happen from greenies, Democrats, environmentalists, or anybody. It's going to happen as you and I individually come down off of the victimhood bleachers and begin to participate in the actual game of life. We we need to quit blaming those people over there and blaming them over there and blaming those people over there. Look in the mirror and say, tomorrow's world is going to reflect the trillions and trillions of little decisions made by individuals like me that, today. today. And those decisions are going to shape the world that our grandchildren inherit. We, we are not just victims. We are not uh, what you know, um, um, helpless. Uh, we, we are absolutely able to have an effect with our day-to-day decisions on the trajectories that concern us. That's the ultimate hope and the ultimate place we need to each come to. Joel Salatin is the owner of Polyface Farms in Swope, Virginia. Joel, I thank you so much for your time. I couldn't imagine a better way to end the show. I wish you the best of luck, and I hope the 10,000 people that are coming to your farm turn into 20. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) It's it's been great to be with you. I appreciate your time. Folks, you're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. We'll have final comments after this break. Thanks again, Joel. Creating an environmentally friendly farm from land nicknamed the Badlands takes a lot of knowledge about farming practices and their effects on the environment, both good and bad. It also takes knowledge on how to care for the animals, the cows, the pigs, the chickens, the turkeys, etc. Coastal Alabama Community College offers degrees and certificates in the fields of environmental science, agricultural business and economics, and veterinary technology. The Veterinary Technology Program is an online course, but students have weekly clinical sessions in veterinary offices in Mobile and Baldwin counties, coursework as well as hands-on experience. For details, go to coastalalabama.edu. We'll be back. I'm Matt Armbruster with Ransom Ministries. We help people in our community that most others have given up on. Please donate your unwanted electronics to Ransom Recycling. We teach life skills, job readiness, and job creation through our electronic recycling program. We take anything with a cord. Find us at RansomMinistries.com or you can call us at 251-751-0044. Coastal Alabama Community College is three amazing colleges combined into one incredible institution. And that means we're all together. For more sports, 15 more locations, more friends, more one-on-one time with instructors, way more activities, more courses, a lot more courses, and more success for all of us. Pretty much more of everything. Coastal Alabama Community College is where everyone is. All together! Coastal Alabama Community College. Register today. Is your business growing? Does your existing metal building need an update? Expansion? New roof? With almost 20 years of experience, Mosley Building Systems is the leading metal building contractor along the Gulf Coast. We are your local design build experts. From expansion to new construction or repairs, we can guide you through all aspects of your project. Mosley Building Systems works with each client to fulfill their vision. For more information, go to MosleyBuildingSystems.com. time this week i want to thank Kristen ogden for helping me get joel on the line and i want to thank john thompson he's the show's producer we'll have another show next week everybody thank you very much and have a good week 